everybody, it's Dr. Lori, the PhD Antiques Appraiser, the expert of experts, and I'm here with you. How are you? Hi, welcome. It's Ask Dr. Lori Live, where you can ask me anything. What I'm going to talk to you about in an upcoming video is jewelry, and I want to talk to you about that, and I'm going to teach you how to use the loops. A lot of you are getting the loops, and I want you to be able to use them to their ultimate use, right? So you get everything out of it. A couple of things I want you to look. I want you to look for refraction of color. That means very, very bright color when you're looking for costume jewelry. I want you to look for the nice color, the clarity of the color. So when you see it, you don't see any cloudy areas. No cloudy areas in these pins, brooches, necklaces, bracelets, rings that have faux or costume jewelry gemstones. Look for those and then look for the different types. And I'm going to teach it to you in an upcoming video. We just shot it. Basically, I want you to also understand and look for the different types of settings. You can ask me anything. So I want to teach you how to know those things so you can recognize the top dollar objects. Today, I was talking to somebody on a video call and we were talking about objects that have been transformed in some way. So some of the costume jewelry, which gets transformed over time, where a bracelet becomes a necklace, you know, because they want to keep the particular, of course, crystals, Austrian crystals or other types of rhinestones and such. So stay tuned for that. It's coming up. Don't forget to, of course, subscribe to the channel. Why? Because this is the channel where I'm going to teach you what to know. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. I need you to subscribe to the YouTube channel. We have nearly 100,000 subscribers coming up. So I really want to get to that because then it opens up a whole different world for you. A lot of options and a lot of specials for you. Got some specials for you too. We'll wait on those for a little bit. But tonight it's all about your questions and my answers. And remember, I'm the PhD antiques appraiser. I evaluate 20,000. I think I evaluate more than 20,000 objects a year now. 20,000 objects a year for 22 years I've been doing this, appraising objects all across the country, all across the world. And now, of course, through um, all of our technology, video calls, and other ways that you can get the pictures to me. Karen, thank you for subscribing. It means a lot. I love your hair too. So thanks for subscribing. It means a lot. It helps all of us. It helps everybody else to allow me to continue to do these videos. And it's going to help your fellow YouTube subscribers too. Hello, Lori Disney. Thanks for being with me. It's always good to see all of you. Thanks so much for your support. I appreciate your support here. And I appreciate your support because it's going to help you here. And it's going to help you in your pocketbook. <laughs> so we're going to make sure that we help you that way too. I'm Dr. Laura. I wanted to give you just a little bit of information, talk to you about what's happening and what's coming up, of course, is not only more videos on things like jewelry and glass and other things, but you know, the jewelry makes me think of some of the places that I've been. Why? Because I shop all over. Everywhere I go, I do a little shopping. Aren't we all like that? And one of the places that I really miss is I miss a place that's really well known for jewelry and for glass. And that, of course, is Venice. Yeah, the Italians are having a time of trying to get, of course, travelers to go back to places that we love. One of the places I love, of course, the Grand Canal in Venice. And this picture actually was taken from the bridge of a major cruise ship, a gorgeous opportunity. And uh, I was lecturing on the ship about art and about antiques and objects. And that particular picture is fun because it reminds me of the time when I was asked to go up on the bridge. So you've probably been on the bridge if you've ever been cruising or on a trip like that. And I went up onto the bridge and the bridge, of course, had an Italian captain, a lovely guy, a nice guy. And in fact, my job on the bridge as, of course, the expert on the cruise was to teach everybody and tell everybody, do a little sort of intro as we sailed into beautiful Venice. It's breathtaking to sail in to tell them about the different architecture and what you're going to see in the background, the history, the great Byzantine city, of course, of Venice, and of course, the great stronghold of Venice, things about the art in St. Mark's Square, what do the lion symbols mean? That's the Doge's Palace right there over on the right-hand side of the screen where the Doge's, or that would have been the elected civic official, sort of the top dog, right, in Venice. Uh, that is his palace. The palace is an administrative center. It also had the courts in it. But anyway, enough about history. Anyway, what was wonderful about it was, was uh, that particular piece. Oh, Wyoming lady has a question. 
Thanks to you, I'm a, I'm soon to be a full-time reseller. Oh, that's great. Thanks for all the great information. Long trips for sourcing, but you can do it. You're the best. Oh, I'm so happy for you, Wyoming lady. I hope to get to Wyoming. One of the states, I've been to almost all the United States, but Wyoming, I haven't been there. So I hope to see you. Congratulations. Thanks for the super chat. I appreciate the support in the super chat that also supports the channel and us to make more videos. Um, but I'm so proud of you. I'm happy for all of you. I want to hear about your success. Good, good for you. You're happy to be a full timer. I'm happy to hear that. Um, I have an 1800s Victorian glass beaded tray. What would you say the price, the price range is on this? Okay, I have to see it. So while you might be correctly identifying it, while you might be correctly describing it, an 1800s Victorian. So that means it's going to be if it's really Victorian, it's from 1837 to 1901, that whole time period. So the ones that are, of course, from the 1850s are going to have a different value than the ones that are from the 1890s. Send me a picture. I'll be happy to take a look at it. Thanks. Hi, Heather. Heather, thank you so much for supporting the channel with a big super chat. Hi, Dr. Lori. I miss your live events. I know. I've seen your live events for years here in Pennsylvania. Can't wait to see you again in person soon. My husband and father say hello as well. Well, hello to everybody in the family. Thanks for the families coming together. Of course, we're all going to be back to doing everything live. The big event organizers can cannot host all of these big events where I usually appear. But, you know, the second that we can do all of that and everything's safe and sound, we will be there. I can't wait to be with all of you in person again. I miss my live events too, but my virtual events are just as much fun. And so is the live right here. Ask Dr. Lori, you can ask me anything. What was funny about Venice that particular time when I was on the bridge, so I'm talking about Venice and I'm talking about Murano, I'm talking about the glass, I'm having so much fun on the bridge, it's beautiful, wonderful. I had to get up very, very early. I don't like the early getting up thing. I don't like it at all. It reminds me of the days when I was doing the TV, the TV talk show and I had to be on the set at 6.30, totally too early. But anyway, so I had to get up really early to do this, to do the sailing. So we get a full day, a couple full days in Venice. And the place I was ready to go was, of course, Murano, right? Because Venice is 117 islands. And one of them is Murano. Murano is a beautiful place where all the glass is. Cindy, thank you so much for the super chat. We love you. I love you guys. I really do. Have you ever thought about holding a class on validating items? For example, on the great courses. I do great courses on this channel all the time. All you got to do is watch. You can be here and ask those questions, but I do it like a course all the time. I think my channel is like a big university course. Other people aren't teaching you what I'm teaching you. You know that. Other people don't know what I know. I want to share all this knowledge. This is a lot of information. This isn't only all the book smarts, but this is all the experience too. I'm not coming to this from just one side. I know all sides. This is from the museum, sitting in the museum director chair, sitting as a curator, which I did, being a university professor. I want to teach you all of it. So keep looking at the channel, subscribe and share. Donald, thank you so much for the super sticker. I love the bow tie. Handsome Donald, thank you very much for the super sticker. I appreciate the support. It means a lot to me. It means a lot also to all of your fellow viewers, all of our fellow subscribers. You got to subscribe. We got to make 100,000 uh, subscribers and we got to do it soon. So hopefully I need your help. I hope you will help me to do that. I appreciate all that you've done thus far. And I know that it's helping. I know that it's helping because you're telling me and it really warms my heart. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, YouTube, subscribe, hit the bell, hit the red subscribe button. And on your device, you might have to scroll to find the subscribe button, go from there. And the other place you got to remember, you've got to remember, of course, to go to the community tab. The community tab is where the specials are going to be. If I have something that's a big deal that's happening, the community tab is going to be the place. There's a question there about Yadros, and I will answer that question in a minute. Extras on the community tab. That's right. So there's going to be specials on the community tab. Here's the special for tonight because you're with me. Free shipping on t-shirts. That's right. The Dr. Lori Says t-shirt and free specials on the Dr. Lori Says mug. So you can go right there to the community tab and you can, of course, learn a little bit more about that. That's on YouTube. Okay, one more time for the Yadros. I'm sorry. Maybe we can get that question. That particular question had, if we can ask you anything, yeah, you can ask me anything. I'm serious. Ask me anything. I won't tell you what I weigh, but ask me anything. <laughs> What's a good market to sell Yadro clowns or clown figurines in general? Okay. Clowns are one of those things that go up and down, right? Sometimes clowns are really in. They were in just about the time that the Ringling Brother Barnum and Bailey Circus was starting to, of course, close down. Clowns saw a big spike then. So clowns go up and down. 
Right now, you're not seeing a great interest in the clowns other than Murano, Murano clown figurines. Thank you very much, Lori. So the best places with respect to that would be, um, of course, uh, your big global, your big global websites for reselling, the Ebays, you know, the big ones. Um, thanks. I'm glad that you have the t-shirt. I'm glad that you have the mug and I'm glad you like it. Hi, Frida. I'm elated. I finally caught you live. Here I am. You got my sister and hubby to start watching you too. I love you. I love you too. Thank you for sharing it and telling everybody else about watching. It's a lot of fun. Thanks for being with me live. And thanks so much for your support with the super chat. I appreciate that too. So we'll take those particular questions, but we like to give something back. I like to give something back. So free shipping is what we're going to give back. We're going to give back that and coupons. You're going to find those coupons at the community tab. So go check those out. Um, as the PhD antiques appraiser, I like to go to these places and I like to make connections and travel. I don't know if you guys are missing travel, you know, big travel. Some of you are doing it and some of you can't, but um, places like, of course, Murano, where you could see where the furnaces, the glass furnaces are making beautiful pieces like the Murano glass pieces that everybody's looking for. So here's a shot of the actual inside of the Murano glass factory. And this is one of the tables. They would make the wares in the furnaces and then they would put it out so you could see what they, what they, how it actually looks close up after you watch them produce the piece. So it's really kind of amazing. One of the things I remember, it was a piece of Murano and, they, and then the artisan actually was able to make a model or a mock-up of Botticelli's uh, Birth of Venus. So it was actually that piece was beautiful, but all of them are gorgeous. They're beautifully made, hand blown. And then here's one that's really spectacular, piece like this one. And this particular piece is a wonderful example of some of the chandeliers that are made, of course, with Murano. And you, a lot of you see Murano. A lot of you thrifters see a lot of Murano, but pretty fantastic, wonderful. Kelly, have you ever seen a ceramic piece covered in wax? Yes, yes. And caustic or covering ceramic in wax is not unusual. There's also um, another element that's very popular in Germany in the 1950s and 60s, and it's called hot lava. And it kind of looks like it's wax, but actually it is an application or um, an extension of that idea of a nice mid-century modern ceramic piece. And then they actually put it looks like lava coming on top of the actual ceramic. That's very popular with German ceramics of the 1950s and 60s. But yes, the encaustic or the wax covered is something eh, relatively well known. Hi, Miss Kim. So excited to see you. I haven't had time to get back to you for my antique Uncle Sam. Love you. I love you too. Thanks so much. If you have something that you want me to see, of course, you can go to the website, drlaurieV.com and send me a photograph. I'll be happy to take a look at that as well. So lots of stuff. Remember, it's free to subscribe to the channel. So please subscribe to the channel. And of course, the community tab is where to go. The junking data girl. Dr. Lori, I have a huge assortment of brooches. Do not have time to go through all of them. How should I store them till I review them? Okay. Well, if you don't have time to go through all of them, you can always use one of my services to do that, right? So you can do a video chat with me or something else. But if you don't have time, how do you store them? If you look at the jewelry box right in front of me, one of the things that you always want to do, separate them, separate them. So even if you separate them, because if you put them all together in just one big, huge pile, I remember I was with one of the TV hosts. <laughs> she had all of her jewelry out because she ran, she threw all of her jewelry. She ran to the set. She was late to the set. She threw everything into the pocketbook. It was all of her jewelry, costume and other jewelry, just shoved into a purse, throwing them in there. And she was going to put it on there. And I said, what are you doing? You're going to scratch and ruin everything. So not in a big pile, separate them, separate them. I don't care if you use Ziploc bags. I don't care if you use uh, little pieces. I don't care if you take toilet, toilet paper roll and you just start rolling each one, right? Just roll them. You can do that too, as long as you separate them somehow. Best thing, a jewelry box. Uh, good question though, and I'll help you if you need appraisals. Was at an estate sale at a mansion and found an ancient clay cup or jar. Well, cup's different from a jar. Nobody can tell me, nobody can tell me what it is. Nobody knows what it is. Hello. Do you know how many of these things, these mistakes that these other people have made that I've fixed? I can tell you what it is. You got to show it to me. Who can I ask? This question is just silly to me. Who could you ask? Here I am. You see me? I'm in red. You can like your whole eye will stop that you can, who would you ask? Ask me. So I'll help you. Yeah. Send me a picture. I'll be happy to know. First of all, I'll know the difference between a cup and a jar and you should too. I'm sure you do. And uh, I'll be able to tell you if it actually is ancient or if it's a fake. <laughs> Good question. Good question. Hello from Pittsburgh. Yeah, we love the Berg. Yeah, we love the Berg. And the Berg loves me. They've been good to me. Pittsburgh's been good to me for a long time. Nice to be with you. 
Happy to see you. Thanks for subscribing. Yeah, we'll be back in Pittsburgh as soon as possible. Pittsburgh's a lot of fun. And on Tuesdays, every Tuesday, of course, I'm right there at their CBS station in Pittsburgh uh, doing um, Pittsburgh Today Live. So you can play my treasure hunt game when we're there. We play that on Thursday nights, don't forget. But tomorrow night, tomorrow night is going to be the premiere, right? The Sunday premiere of the new video. You know what the new, new Dr. Lori video is going to be this week? It's going to feature all of you. Yes, all of you. Here you are with the pieces that you sent me. You sent me in those videos and I appraised your pieces for you. There we go. So we're going to see you tomorrow night. That was a great story too. You all had great stories, great finds. And of course, I'm going to share them with all of you. So I hope to see you tomorrow night and the live premiere Sunday night, 5 p.m. Eastern. I'll see you there too. Anyway, this is Ask Dr. Lori live. More questions from you. Let's see what other questions we got. Uh, Karen Renee, how do I find out the value of a Department 56 figurine from 2008 from their Golden Garden line? where I can't find a single other one for sale. I've been looking for two years. Okay, well, you're looking in the wrong place. A say, what's listed as sale will not give you the authenticated indicator of the market, okay? If you're looking at listing prices, oh, I can't find what somebody else thinks it's worth. How come when they list it for something, you're gonna believe that that's what it's really worth? You need an expert to help you with respect to that, okay? And you have to remember that right now, those types of figurines, those particular pieces from Department 56, which relate to, of course, the Christmas theme, are going to be at the, their lowest. In January, holiday items are at their lowest because everybody's not thinking about holiday now. You really should be thinking about um, learning about and identifying those particular market values, right? Actual retail values based on a sales record, not just what some number somebody throws up on some website where they want to sell it, right? And then I want you to remember that that particular idea will be, in fact, the time to actually look for that sales record is going to be in November, from about November 1st to about the end of the year. So I can help you. You can send me a picture right to the website. It's very easy to do. When you're on my website, don't forget to the save now. Don't forget to the save now um, piece as well. Don't forget you also can, again, get in touch and... Um, get some of these pieces, the, these particular items, like the mug, like, of course, the T-shirt. Go to the community tab because there's a special there. Don't forget to go to the specials page and don't forget about uh, utilizing Teespring. I'm sorry, I missed that question. I'm sorry, I'm talking. My T-shirt came today, I love it, but it's too big. That's good. I'm so glad that it's too big. That means you're thinner. That's good. I think that's happy. But if you want to return it, you'd contact teespring.com. They're the folks who are making t-shirts. I'm the woman who's going to tell you how to make money with your art, antiques, and collectibles. I'm not t-shirts. <laughs> but I'm glad that you bought it. I'm sorry it's too big, and I'm sure that they'll take care of it. Lori, your shirt is, is believable. It's 100% cotton. It'll shrink up if you wash it in hot water. Oh, well, there's a tip. I don't know if you want to do that. Maybe you want to return it. Lori said, Lori Disney says that if you shrink it in hot water, it'll shrink because it's 100% cotton. So if you want to try that, go ahead. If not, contact teespring.com. Okay, good questions. What are the best resources besides you? There's no other resources besides me. <laughs> to have on hand before beginning to learn about vintage and antique items, hard to know the most helpful and accurate. I'm going to tell you a couple of things that you need to know. First of all, what do you have to have on hand? You need to have a loop. You need that actual, the loop that I recommend is on my website, right at the top, save now, drlaurieview.com, save now. Okay, that's the loop. You need to be able to have a way to really look at the items. That's what you have to do. The other thing that you need to do is you need to forget about all of these stupid ideas that people are giving about testing with acid, those stupid, silly tests that are just going to damage your piece. What else do you need to know? So you need to have the binge link nearby. That's the Dr. Lori binge link right? So the binge link, of course, to the videos, because there's all different videos that I'm going to offer. So if you're looking at glass and you want a background on glass or a primer on glass, the binge link. If you want to know jewelry, the binge link. We have playlists too for things like, of course, ceramics or China, or how do you identify different plates? So those are some of the things that you want to have on hand. If you want to have on hand things like these um, lists, right? I have to say a lot of these lists or a lot of these sales numbers, these sort of um, values, they change as quickly as the day. So, you know, they change very, very fast. So you're not, those are always going to be obsolete. So I would say the thing that you really need and you need to sort of learn the lesson. The other thing you might want to do is you might want to niche collect. What does that mean? Collect a category, learn that category, learn it well. I was talking today in a video call to a woman who said, I've only done, I've only resold 
jewelry. That's what I've resold. I've resold costume jewelry of a particular time period of the 1950s and 60s. That's all I've done. And I know all there is to know about that particular market, that particular time period, that particular type of stuff. Now, you know, me, you know, you know, I know people say, oh, I want to compare myself to Dr. Lori, but you know, I've had to learn all of it. If you have to teach from Mesopotamia and the ancient world to me, you got to know all of it. That takes a long time. That takes a lot of devoted time, right? You know, I'm not picking up Joey at soccer practice. I'm doing this all the time. So those are some of the things I think you really need to have. I do think that utilize the web, utilize the website, which has research on my website. And I would also utilize, of course, the binge link. It's the best way to do it. Okay, I'm sorry. This is that's Dr. Lori Live. More questions for you. You can ask me anything. Homeschool mom. I hope you guys are doing well. The homeschoolers are doing yeoman's work now. So thanks for being here. Thanks for the super chat. I have a Samuel Roscoe Chaffee, excellent watercolor, large vertical landscape of birch trees. Wow. Beautiful frame has minor issues. What's it worth? I have to see it. I will tell you that Chaffee's works will start as low as 500 and as high as 2,500. So that's a range, but I have to see how good it is. Landscapes are good. When you say large, I need to know how large. Is it 16 by 20, 20 by 24? Is it 30, 30 by 36? You know, large is one of those words. So I need a little more specifics about it. And I need to also see it, of course, out of the frame. But um, you'll be able to do that. You can send a picture. Hi, Mary. Mary, go blue, Mary. Is there silver jewelry that isn't stamped or marked? I have a few pieces that I think might be. Okay, so there's there's different levels, of course, of sterling silver jewelry. There's silver that might just say silver. There's silver that might say Mexican silver. There's silver that might say 800 German silver. There's silver that might say 925 sterling silver. So yes, it can be high quality silver and unmarked. Remember, I'm the expert to answer your questions. I want to answer your questions so you get the right information. So it's not just people saying, oh, I don't really know what this is, but oh, isn't it pretty? You know, we did show and tell in, in first grade and second grade. Here, we're trying to learn how to make money, how to flip those pieces, and how to identify what's valuable at the thrift store, the yard sale, the antique mall, and of course, grandma's house. <laughs> All right. Don't forget the binge link. And again, I need your help with sharing, and I need your help with, of course, um, subscribing to the channel. Does gravel art have any worth or only certain types? Well, gravel art tends to have specific pieces tend to have more desirability in the market right now. Uh, about three years ago, all of it was very, very collectible. Right now you're seeing specific pieces. That's what happens with markets. You know, what tends to happen with some of the markets is these people send to so, oh, the, the market is hot, the market is hot. Then people start to get very well versed in the piece. And then the market, of course, the, the collectors tend to get a little bit more picky. That's what tends to happen. Ask me anything. This is Dr. Lori live. And I appreciate all the positive feedback we're getting about the channel and also about, of course, the Dr. Lori live. Uh, the market always fluctuates. That's right. I know in the past you have stated precious metals and art always keeps its value. Is there anything else we can keep a, a lookout for? Yeah. I would look for precious metals, jewelry, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me. Wow. That's a big sneeze. Sorry guys. Precious metals, jewelry, fine art. Okay. Precious metals is easiest. I think because there's all the marks on it. All you have to do is learn the marks and identify what you identify. And I can help you do that. So that's a little bit easier. Um, cause you've got things like, of course the tester, right? You've got things like the diamond tester that you can use. There are a lot of tools that you can use. So that's one of the tools that you should have standing by in, in addition to your loop. But the other thing, and what I recommend is on our website, but the other thing is fine art, that's furniture, sculpture, precious metals, and of course, uh, paintings, watercolors too. Clocks also. Hi, Dr. Lori, Harmony Village. I recently became obsessed with Persian and hand-knotted rugs. Well, yeah. Do you ever discuss vintage rugs? I do. At many of my events, people have brought beautiful rugs. At many of my appraisals for folks, beautiful rugs. The thing about rugs is to learn the knots. Okay, the type of knots. For example, the double knot of the Turks. The Turkish typically have a double knot process. You're also going to see where silk, different materials. I talk about this all the time. I want you to get this. The silk kind of pieces are going to be, you know, widely popular and very expensive, very very high quality versus wool. And then you're going to see, of course, um, you know, uh, uh, Caucasian rugs. You're going to see Persian rugs. You're going to see other types. And then the different patterns, whether you have a field rug or a rug that's a prayer rug with a mirab niche, 
um, image on it, all different types of things. But yes, I will talk about rugs. But the way to start your education on rugs right here has to do with knots, how it's actually knotted on the loom. Once you learn that, all of a sudden you're going to look at a, a, a rug and you're going to say, well, that rug looks like this rug. And you're going to say, oh, no, the knots are different and you're going to know the difference. So, yeah. Persian rugs are a very good thing. Uh, they were they were really at the bottom of the market where it was really a bargain in about 2003, 2004, uh, when, of course, we had all the upheaval in Iraq. I found Otagiri platter with a lobster and four cabbage leaves. I can't find any information on it. Really? You can't? Okay, well, I can help you with that, too. When you're looking and trying to search, I want you to know your sources. Because a lot of you are searching and you're getting information, which can be misinformation from these sources who are not reliable. A lot of people have a lot of gumption and they put this is a this and it's a that and it's a, and they don't know what they're talking about. So I want to make sure that you get the source that's reliable for you. So when you're looking to do that, and I'll help you navigate that because navigating all of this information is going to be important. And in the last uh, six months to the last year, you really have seen a lot of people come into the antique and thrifting and what we call reselling market, even the, the, um, upcycling and repurposing market. A lot of these folks were saying, well, I got it for nothing. It must be worth nothing. And that's not always the case. So I'll help you navigate that. Shelly, I have a rocking chair that's 100 plus years old. Could it be worth anything? Yes. But age is not a value indicator. So just because it's old doesn't mean it's valuable. All right. So you want to make sure you remember that new things can be valuable too. But yes, and a rocking chair, which might be 100 years old, Typically an antique, if it's more than 100 years old, it's technically defined as an antique. Those particular pieces, those pieces can, in fact, um, be valuable as long as condition is good. Look for solid hard woods. Look for a seat, whether it's caned, whether it's woven, whether it's upholstered, maybe it's leather. Whatever the seat is, we have to have a nice, strong construction of that, too. Um, decorative, decorative crest rail, that's the back right? The crest rail on this chair, this is the crest rail, the back, because it's like a crest of a wave, right? So that needs to be decorated in some way, that kind of thing. So look for materials, look for strength, look for nice designs. And yeah, a little bit of age, never hurt anybody. Usually that's what people are looking for. Uh, Rachel, I have what looks to be either an eight by 10 pen and ink or pencil sketch landscape picture by Richard Grosvenor. What do I think? Okay, I think a couple of things. Pen and ink or pencil sketch, you should be able to, with your loop, look at that piece and look whether or not you have actual strokes. Think of when you wrote a check, right? You wrote a check with a pen, you made a stroke, right? So those particular strokes are going to actually tell you whether or not it's a pen and ink, right? Is it a pen and ink or is it a print that looks like a pen and ink, right? Or is it actually pencil? Graphite and ink don't look the same once they're on paper. So think about when you drew with a pencil or wrote something down a note with a pencil and think about when you wrote a note with a pen or ink. Very, very different. So take a good look and then you'll know the difference of that. And then of course, looking at the artist's mature sales record. Sales records of that particular artist is going to be very important to understand where the market is now, right? And remember, this is a different market from the antique ceramics market, the antique toy market, the vintage, uh, accessories, purses, pocketbooks, kind of market, those kinds of things. Good question. Shell, I have my paintings in climate control storage. Good. How long can oil paintings remain in the dark? All right, a couple of things. First of all, prints are the things that really need to be in the dark, okay? Oil paintings, it's fine if they're in the dark. If they're not in the dark, it's fine as well. If they're in climate controlled storage, that's really what you're looking for. You're looking for no temperature and humidity changes for oil paintings on canvas. Darkness isn't going to be a problem. The thing that's going to be a problem usually with paintings is that they're not hung up. Anytime you stack a painting, I want them stacked back to back or face to face, back to back or face to face. Okay. That's the first thing. If they're in climate controlled storage, make sure they are not wrapped in bubble wrap. They should be wrapped in a towel, white cotton terry cloth, maybe an old cotton sheet. They should be wrapped like that, and then they should be back to back and face to face. They should be stored up on a table, maybe a six foot table. You can get at a place like Staples or Lowe's or or one of those places. You know, an inexpensive twenty dollar long table, and then they go up on that table. So if water does seep into your climate controlled place, and usually the climate controlled places don't have a problem with water coming in because they're not right on the ground. It's not like a garage kind of in, in environment. Um, then what you want to do is you want to make sure that they're up off the ground. That's the best thing. Even if it's your own basement, 
and you're keeping them in climate control. Even if it's not a storage unit, uh, you want to make sure that they're up off the ground. The other thing is if they're in the dark, it shouldn't hurt them. Temperature and humidity will ch changes will hurt them. So a lot of heat will hurt. A lot of cold will hurt. Water dampness will hurt, that kind of thing. So you're probably fine as long as they are not wrapped in bubble wrap and they're not stuck right up, up, up against each other. So be aware of that. Good question. Good question. Preservation is what's going to hold value. They got to be in good shape. I purchased a large oil painting on in a consignment. Uh, the artist's name appears to be O.S.T. Varts. Do you know the artist? I will send a picture later. Send a picture. Send me a picture. I'll take a look. With all due respect, you may have the artist name right, and you may not have the artist name right. A couple of things that a lot of people are getting uh, mixed up on when it comes to identifying artist signatures. They're seeing a V, and sometimes they see a V, and they, they think that that's the first name, like Vicky or Victoria or Veronica, when in fact, or Victor, when in fact the V is actually part of the last name, like Vaughn or Van from the Netherlands or Northern European artists. So be careful. I'll help you with the names. One of the big tips that all of you should be using when you're trying to identify, of course, an artist's name and a signature, if you're trying to figure out the signature, try to copy the signature, try to write it out. That process from the brain, of course, to the hand will help you to identify who it is. I'm here to, to answer your questions. I'm the PhD antiques appraiser, Dr. Lori. I love to answer your questions. You can ask me anything. Ask me about travel. Ask me about glass. Ask me about jewelry. Ask me about thrifting. How do you sell something? Thank you for the super for the super chat. I appreciate it. This is how we support the channel. This is how I'm able to do more videos for you. Longtime fan here. Thank you, Bree. Is there a way of dating art glass or wood as vintage or antique by its color and texture, et cetera? Okay. So a couple of things, certain colors, right? Certain colors are more important or more prevalent, not important, but more prevalent at certain time periods, okay? So when you're looking at art glass, some of the brown and the amber and the um, off uh, sort of the copper tone orange colors are usually colors that we see in the late part of the 20th century. When it comes to ceramics, we typically see very bright colors in the 19, late 1940s and into the 1950s and 60s during a time of great prosperity. I've talked about that in other videos about how you can tell. When it comes to, of course, wooden pieces, I want you to see where that changeover is from solid hardwood carvings, right, to pressed wood and moldings. So mid-century modern starts to see this idea of what I call glued together sawdust stuff. And you see that after 1975 with MDF and that kind of stuff. So when you start to see the different materials change, that will help you to identify time period. As for antique versus vintage, antique is anything 100 years old or more. Vintage, anything 100 years, uh, 99 years old or less. Some people consider vintage to be 20 years old, right? If it's 20 years old, it's considered vintage. I know a lot of the the websites where people are listing pieces for sale will say it has to be vintage or at least 20 years old. Well, that only puts us back, of course, into the early 2000s, right, or the late 1990s, so or 1999-ish. So basically, you're looking at that idea and you're starting to see that those particular ideas, vintage is a term that sort of has a larger umbrella than, than like antique. Antique is 100 years old or more, period. Yeah, I'm happy to answer all of your questions. You can ask me anything. You can ask me anything. So thank you so much for the super chats and the super ch stickers. It shows me that you really, that the, that the videos are really helping you. I know a lot of you have told me that you are making money because of the videos, and I'm grateful to that. Wendy Williams, how are you, Dr. Lori? Are you fluent in Native American jewelry? Well, I'm not fluent in that language, <laughs> but I'm fluent, of course, in identifying and appraising Native American jewelry jewelry, pieces from squash blossom necklaces, of course, to many of the great pieces from the Navajo, the Hopi, the Zuni, and others. Um, I've appraised all different types of pieces like that and can do so. There's information also on my website under the research tab on my website for Native American jewelry. Also, old pawn jewelry, which you might know that term. If you don't, I'll teach it to you. And, um, but yeah, I can certainly do that. I can certainly do that. It reminds me of one of my very dear friends. She's so sweet. And she makes me laugh because, you know, she'll put on her squash blossom necklace and she'll go, I feel powerful. You know, she'll say, I feel powerful when I put that on. So that, those are beautiful pieces, of course, of tur turquoise. Some are, of course, of red coral and, uh, and other stones that are carved and inset by many of the wonderful jewelry designers 
of, of course, the native or the first indigenous people of North America. Linda, I have a uranium glass rosary. Are they worth anything? Rosary beads had a great impact and a great collecting time around the middle part of the 1980s, and it is reviving now. You're seeing a lot of people. Uh, around the time that um, Pope Francis uh, was actually uh, given the, the position of, of course, the Pope um, elected, what we saw was rosary beads go up. Uranium glass rosaries are very, very sought after, rare, unique, beautiful. Um, I wonder what color yours is. Is it a yellow and a green? I wonder what color yours is, but really quite beautiful. Yeah, those will definitely have significant value. Yep, yep, yep. Hi, Dr. Lurie. Is an Ajax green glass jar worth anything? Yeah, yeah, Lucy. Ajax green glass jars can be worth um, a little bit, a little bit. I don't know how, where you acquired yours. I do see a lot of them in the flea markets, more so in the flea markets than I see in the thrift stores. It's interesting. People will put something out with a flea market or maybe to the, the guys who move pull away the junk stuff for you out of the garage or the basement, but they won't actually usually donate those pieces into thrift stores. So it's kind of interesting where they are. And that's something that I trace oftentimes, you know, where did you get this? How is the market moving? And that's an important point as well. But yeah, it could have some value. Usually you're not going to have huge high values. You know, it's not going to buy you the retirement hut in Fiji, you know. <laughs> How can you tell if something is silver plated or all silver? There's lots of ways to tell silver plate from sterling silver. Sterling silver means it's 925 parts per 1,000 parts pure silver. Okay, so close to 100% uh, pure silver. It's 92.5% pure silver. That's sterling silver. But silver plate, you want to look for certain things. Terms like triple plate, quadruple plate. Terms like silver plated, terms like A1A, terms like triple A, you know, the letters A, 1A, A1, all of these are symbols uh, basically for silver plate. So there are different types of silver plate. You might also see EPNS, you might see EP, um, you might see EPCS, um, you might see all different types of marks, but those are some of them. Some of them. Yep. This is why this is great to rewatch because this kind of information is information that other people don't know off the top of their head. So I like to tell you that. Kathy, thank you for the super sticker. I hope that super sticker means that my videos have been giving you some fun, making you laugh, teaching you some stuff and making you money. I appreciate the super sticker, Kathy. Thank you so much. I hope it's been successful and happy for you. That's what I hope. That's why I do it. So remember to go to the community tab. The community tab is where I'm going to put the specials, where I'm going to put the special codes, where I'm going to show you all the extras, right, are going to be on the community tab. Please get yourself comfortable and used to going to the community tab. How do you get to the community tab? Dr. Lori, I can't find the community tab. Dr. Lori, this happened, that happened. All week long, I hear that. Guess what? You need to subscribe so you can get to the community tab, so you can you can benefit from the specials and the extras that I put on the community tab. So please do that. Subscribe, ring the bell, tell your friends, don't forget to share. Other questions, you can ask me anything. That's right, it's Ask Dr. Lori Live. It's Saturday night, Ask Dr. Lori Live. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Lori, is all Coro jewelry marked? Judy, Coro jewelry tends to be marked. We see a lot of it. We see different marks throughout. So lots of Coro jewelry is marked. You'll get the stray piece that might be a prototype that's made by Coro, didn't get marked, this kind of thing. That does happen. But for example, Coro, like Weiss, like uh, uh, Hattie Carnegie, like, um, oh, let's see, like uh, Trafari and Marvella and Sarah Coventry and Kenneth J. Lane and um, Graziano. And I mean, I can go on and on and on and on. But like the Trafari pieces, if you look at the different marks, a crown Trafari piece is one uh, date range. And then a Trafari piece with a, with a C or a copyright symbol is another date range. So you want to think about looking at them very carefully of how they're scripted. Uh, Schiaparelli, for example, the Schiaparelli pieces, you're going to see where it's a oval and then it's got, in fact, her name in cursive writing. You know, the little kids now don't even know what cursive writing is. So, you know, you're looking at that. So that that type of thing. But cursive writing will be a different time period versus a block of the same maker. So make sure that you start to learn what's what. And then some of them, of course, there are fakes out there too using those names. 
So you want to look for those and make sure you identify those. If you can't, I can. Hi, Karen. Do you do videos about figuring out trends? How can we be ahead of the curve? Yes. I talked about, of course, Art Deco years ago. It was about 10 years ago. I told you what you should be collecting then for, of course, value now. And I do that. I don't think, Karen, you're using the binge link. You've got to get that binge link, baby. So use the binge link. There's a lot there. And it is about what to look for, what to collect now. I've been telling a lot of you that, you know, in 2022, some of your collectibles that relate to Princess Diana are going to spike because that's the 25th anniversary of her death. I've been telling you that certain types of crystal and glass are going to spike in the next year or two years. So you got to really be collecting them now and holding them now for the top dollar that they're going to have because they're going to experience a revival as well. So there's certain pieces that I actually do. Lori, Lori, Lori. Hi, Lori. Thank you for the super sticker. I love you. Thank you so much for supporting the channel for years and years. I appreciate it, Lori. Nice to see you. The other thing I want you to remember is, yes, I can tell you this because I've been studying this for a long time. You know, actually, I'm invited. I've been invited consecutive years to talk to financial advisors, the folks who are deciding about 401ks and how can we do the markets, about how these particular assets, the assets that are alternative assets, like art, antique, collectibles, jewelry, how those assets actually are going to increase in value and what assets they should you should put your actual monies toward so you can grow your retirement or grow, of course, your nest egg, grow your portfolio. I talk to the folks in the big, of course, um, in the big Wall Street folks who are saying, Dr. Lori, you're going to tell me, you know, how I can help my clients to identify this. So I've been doing that um, at places like Barron's and other places for years. So as an expert, I'm even teaching the experts what to look for. So sure, I'll share that information with you here, right on the channel, of course. You can ask me anything. This is Ask Dr. Lori Live. I wanted to make sure that you know what's what. I appreciate the super chats. Thank you very much for the super stickers too. I know a lot of you are enjoying the community and chatting with one another, chatting with each other while you know we're here. Don't forget about tomorrow. Tomorrow, of course, is the Sunday, is the Sunday 5 p.m. premiere of next of this new video that I'm going to put out. Other questions for me about glass, about jewelry, about what you've done, or tell me what's been happening. What's happening in your thrift store? What's happening as you're selling online? What's happening as you're trying to downsize? I was talking today with um, a young woman who was helping her mom to downsize. Linda, how do you, do you have a Facebook page for your fans? If not, it's time. Oh my gosh, Linda. <laughs> yes, Linda, my Facebook page is right there. Dr. Lori V, of course, um, is the Facebook page. The YouTube channel is where I take the comments, of course. So yes, I have all the social media channels are there and they have been for very many years. Um, so you can find me on Instagram if that's what you like, or if you like Twitter, or if you like Facebook, of course, YouTube is where all the videos are. Don't forget to use the binge link. Thank you. I have a 50s torch stifle lamp where the post has blank paint peeling. Is it still worth anything? Yes, it is. It actually can be conserved. There are folks who like those projects. There are people who say, well, I'll take that lamp for a certain amount of money and then I'll fix it and resell it. Or they just want to repair it themselves or repurpose it themselves so they can use it in their own home. So don't just discount these good quality pieces like a stiffle lamp, you know, good quality, good materials. But of course, over time, something started to deteriorate. Those pieces can still have value, yes. And there are markets for those. A lot of people like to sell on the, speaking of social media, a lot of people like to sell those types of things locally so you don't have to ship the lamp to somebody um, on the social media sites like Facebook Marketplace and others. Sure. Barbara Joy, I bought a framed pair of large solid brass Chinese temple door knockers, each with a fierce foo dog face. Foo dogs, okay. What is the value? My daughter and I love you. I love you and your daughter. So a couple of things. So you, first of all, you have the pair. Remember with um, lions, with food dogs, with nutcrackers, you want a pair. So you always want to have a pair because they're sort of lions at the gate. They're, they're sentinel or guard figures. That's what the food dogs are. They're door knockers. And those particular pieces, depending on the material, will depend on, val on value as well as the age and condition of it. So if you send me a picture, I'll be able to help you with the value, depending on size. That will also be important for the size. Yep, yep, yep. Is Scavo glass only from Italy? I have seen Scavo glass from Italy. I have also seen reproductions of it made in other parts of Asia. 
So, but Scavo Glass, original Italy. Other questions. Hey, Dr. Lori, do you have any info on Murano Glass jewelry? I came across a few necklaces and curious about collectability. I'm going to see. I don't know if it's here. It may not be here on the set tonight. But if you give me five seconds, I can see if I can find a piece. Now they're all going to say, Dr. Lori, what are you doing? But let me see if I can find a piece of Murano glass jewelry. No, I don't think I have it with me here. Murano glass jewelry is oftentimes identified with the rod. This, this jewelry box was actually one from the 1940s. No, I don't have it with me. Um, but I will show it to you. On one of these particular upcoming, upcoming, no, don't have it. Don't have it here in front of me. Um, on one of the upcoming videos, look for it. I will put Murano glass jewelry out. A couple of things that I want uh, you to know about it. First of all, Millefiore, Murano glass jewelry, Millefiore, all the little, of course, um, pendants that are made of all of the little glass rods together. Uh, they kind of look like mosaics, but not quite. And the other ones that are very, very popular, which I happen to like, are the different colored crosses. They are actual, the cross form, very typical in Italy. You know, they do everything with the crosses and, of course, uh, the Vatican and this kind of thing. But um, made of blown glass and their crosses in bright colors. There's red and yellow and blue and such. But I will show those. So, yes, I do know about Murano glass jewelry. I do think that it's quite nice. But remember, it's glass. When push comes to shove, it's glass. So you can make it in large numbers, and a lot of people make it. But it's, it really is quite popular. It came into widespread popularity actually early on um, from Italy, and then it hit its, its peak from the 60s until about the 80s. And then it's been revived in the last, I'd say, five years. With this spark of travel, so many people wanting to travel, and particularly wanting to travel to places like Venice, what I was talking about earlier. You know, my true. If you have questions about travel, if you have questions about souvenir shopping, if you have questions about that, please. I've been all over the world. I'm very, very happy to teach you about that, about those particular pieces that are made in certain places, and how to identify what are the most valuable ones, how to get a good bargain when you're doing that kind of shopping. You know, all of that travel information too, I'm happy to share with you. Other questions. Thanks for that good question. Other questions. So anyway, um, Guy and Jackie, where is the best place to have miscellaneous antiques appraised? I'm not even answering that. <laughs> Come on, sweetheart. I'll help you. I'll appraise it for you. What is it? Send me a picture. It's drlaurieview.com. You can send the photo, you know, and I'll tell you about it and I'll help you identify it and I'll help you to know the true market value of it. Thank you for the super sticker. I appreciate it. But really, I'm, I'm, I, I know many of you probably don't believe I do it. I do it. I, I do it for everybody. So many of you know you're out there saying, oh, I had to appraise this. I used her priority Ask Dr. Lori service. I had a video call. She appraised my stuff. I'll appraise it. I saw you do appraisals from your website. Yes. I saw if it's not more than $59, then you don't charge. What does it cost if you appraise it more than $59? Okay. Here's what it is, Kimberly. If you send me a picture to the website, right? And if you read it, it's right there on the website. And I say, your piece isn't worth the cost of the $59 appraisal written report, right? I'm not going to charge you. I'm going to tell you it's not worth it. Well, I'm not going to do a re written report. I'm not going to charge you to tell you that it's not worth the cost of the report. Because if somebody did that to me, I would think it stinks. So I don't do that. What does that mean? That means you send something in and it's a piece of junk or it's a piece that is worth less than $59. I'm not going to charge you $59 to tell you that. I'm going to tell you it's not worth $59. I think that's fair, right? If you want a written appraisal report and your piece is worth more than the cost of the report, I charge you $59 to have a written report from me. And my reports are different than other reports. Here's why. I talk about condition. I show you a sales record where a similar piece has sold and I correctly identify it. I also put, of course, it on my letterhead. So I'm not just doing, oh yeah, well, it's this and I think it's this and I'm not supporting any of these numbers. I support the values that I give. So that's the difference. If you read it, that's what it says on the website. It's very clear. So thanks for that. Guy and Jackie. Oh gosh, super sticker. <laughs> well, you're very nice to do the super sticker. You guys are sweet and cute. Go to the website, send me a picture of that. I'll help you appraise that. I'll help you appraise that and anything else you've got. I got to remember Guy and Jackie, they're cute. <laughs> Kathy, I was talking to Kathy today. 
Great appraisal session today. Fantastic info. Oh, Kathy, thank you. It's really nice to be with you. I'm glad that we had a chance to do a video call today. Saturdays are fun days for me. I enjoy Saturdays. People are like, why are you doing that on your weekend? Well, you know, a lot of people, you know, during the week, they're very busy. They only have a weekend to talk about things like appraisals. So I offer a lot of video calls during the on the weekend. And it's fun for me to spend a little bit of time talking to all of you on the weekend with video calls. So if that's something you need, you can get in touch. Linda, I have a blue jewel check Ormalu perfume bottle. Wow. Is it collectible? Definitely. Definitely. Check Ormalu, of course, perfume bottles are going to be valuable. Uh, these perfume bottles in general. And if you have watched the, the binge link, if you've checked it out, I talk about how to identify those valuable perfume bottles. You got to check out the binge link. There's all kinds of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of videos that I've done just to teach you all of this, right? All of them. Watch what's coming up. Watch what's coming up tomorrow when I premiere the new video. And of course, it's featuring all of you. I purchased the Haggerty Silver Polish Kit and it's awesome. Ah, I'm so happy. The Silver Polish Kit is really good. And all of my recommendations are good because they're mine, right? After 22 years, 25 years of doing this, you know what? I have a lot of good recommendations about what you should buy, right? I'm giving you on the community tab, of course. I'm giving you a, a coupon special. So go to the community tab for merchandise like my Ask Dr. Uh, Dr. Lori Says t-shirt and of course the, the mug, but also things like my favorite loop, my favorite diamond tester, because diamonds are a girl's best friend, <laughs> and also some of the other pieces for storage. If you have jewelry, the jewelry box is storage. You know, you got to make sure they're separated. You got to make sure that they are in the right kind of material as the base. So there's a lot of good stuff on the website. I worked hard to make sure that you got the best information based on years and years of experience. I only get appraisals from Dr. Lori. There's no need to go anywhere else. Oh, Irene, you're a sweetheart. And there really isn't any need to go anywhere else. I'm gonna help you, I'm gonna shoot straight, I'm gonna tell you the truth. I'm also going to teach you. If you don't understand something, I want you to say to me, Dr. Lori, I don't get that. Can you explain it? And I'll explain it. Thank you, Irene, that's very sweet. Hey, Faye, I bought a signed 13 of 595 print. <laughs> Pay $2 because the frame was damaged. Is it worth it to put it into a new frame or, or leave it as it is? Oh, are you going to resell it would be my first question. If you're going to keep it for yourself, get yourself a new frame. You deserve it. I don't like that the print run is so big, 595. That means there's 594 others of them. I do like that your number in the print run is rather low, which is good, but that's a big print run. That means there's a lot of them. That machine kept going. They kept just printing out more prints. They made a lot of money on that. Um, if you're going to resell it, you could do it either way. You could say, I'm not going to invest any more money. I'm going to take it out of the damaged frame so it doesn't look bad. And I'm going to sell it without the frame. Then you need to get two pieces of foam core board if you're going to sell it because you have to ship it somehow and the frame would protect it when it's shipping. So have conversations, of course, when I talk about, of course, selling tips, which I do a lot, I want on the videos and also on the website on my blog, uh, or my free newsletter, you know, this, to subscribe to this channel is free. The newsletter on my website is free. It's free. What do you have to do? Click a button, set, send in your email. It's not hard. Um, sign up. Um, but remember, you have to, of course, get it to the to the buyer in some way that protects the piece. So don't forget when you're doing that, have a conversation, you know, have the write the email to the buyer and go, Hey, do you want me to put it into a frame and ship it? You probably don't because that's going to cost you and them more in shipping. Or do you want me to put it in a sandwich between two pieces of foam core and then wrap it and then send it? So make sure you know what you're doing with shipping. It's important. Hi, Bonnie. Thank you very much for the super chat. You're supporting the channel and I appreciate that. What decade were ceramic wall pockets of children's faces most popular? I so admired your knowledge. Thank you. I, um, I had a lot of fun establishing and learning all of this. I really did. I enjoyed school. I enjoyed being, I was always, I was the little kid around all the old people and all the old stuff. And I liked it. And I was very lucky. And I feel still very lucky. One of the reasons why I do the channel, I feel still very lucky that I'm able to share this knowledge that I was able to amass it. Um, I didn't get a lot of other things in my life, but I got that. So I'm very grateful for what I got. But your question about the children's faces is a thing of the 1940s, typically. So during the baby boom after World War II of the late 1940s, you're actually going to see those pieces pop up. Wall pockets for plants were the idea of having a little children's cute little face and a wall pocket with like, you know, a plant is their hair kind of thing growing. 
is a thing that actually came out of the late 1940s, early 50s and Dr. Spock. It was thought that having a plant in a baby's nursery or a children's room would help with their development. So in fact, you know, fresh air, that idea um, was something popular. This is how wall pockets got popular. Um, images of children uh, were popular all the way back in the early 1900s, but those wall pockets, those ceramic formed ones are usually the early, like the ninth, late 1940s to about the 1960s. Good question, good question. Value of a Jeff Gordon autographed unused ticket to the very first Brickyard 500 race, which he won NASCAR. Okay, um, Jeff Gordon, super big, you know, autographed, autographs of those folks with an unused ticket. So it didn't go to the piece. If you had gone to the race, right, and you had a picture of your ticket signed by him with him, boy, now there's your value, right? Because you want to have provenance or something to actually identify, right? Confirm that you were there. But if you weren't there, it's an unused ticket between $150 and $250 for the autograph, okay? And you got to make sure that autograph is authentic. Trisha, thank you so much for the super sticker. I appreciate that. I love your curly hair. You remind me of one of my sisters that has all the curls. <laughs> I got the straight and the gray. <laughs> she got the curls. <laughs> anyway. Hi, Dr. Lori. I love your YouTube channel. Thank you. Thank you for these and all your great information. I'm learning so much as fast as I can. Great. I'm so glad. Keep learning. Keep learning. If you have questions right here, ask me anything. Ask Dr. Lori live right here. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And I really do appreciate the super chats, the super stickers. And I appreciate you telling me because I like to hear it. I like to know it's popular. And I like to know what you'd like to see. You know, oh, Dr. Lurie, I wish you would talk about, you know, X. I want you to talk about, you know, Bruno Mali shoes. I want you to talk about Pyrex. I want you to talk about, you know, whatever it might be. So, so I'm happy to do that. Thank you so much for that. Hi, Dr. Lurie, where can we sell China set dishes? Oh, you can't sell the China. Everybody's selling the China. Wow. You know, a lot of people selling the China on a lot of the sites. So a lot of people are selling them in places like eBay. A lot of people are selling them in places like replacements. A lot of people are selling them in places like Etsy and Ruby Lane. Some people are selling them on Cherish.com. Some people are selling them on FirstDibs.com. Are you writing these down? How about the social media channels like Facebook Marketplace? Don't forget about other places like, of course, um, these sites that are sort of the bigger sites, the sites where everybody's going for anything. So you're seeing people selling these kinds of things on places even like the Amazons. So be aware, Craigslist, but I'm just naming a few. I don't think that there's one that's better than the other unless you can tell me a little bit more about what type of china you have. If you have a complete set, I want you to keep the complete set together as well. Don't go breaking up, oh, these are just cups and those are just dishes and I have this. Try to keep sets together as best you can. Don't forget that if you have serving platters, Cups, uh, if you have sugar and creamer, you know, that set, if you have a gravy bone with an underplate, this kind of stuff, those pieces increase value of the whole set. Those accessory pieces are a big deal. Good question. What else have we got? <laughs> We've got a lot to tell you about. Of course, the community tab is where I'm going to put all of the information. So it's free to subscribe. You've got to subscribe. And don't forget that. Oh, antique fountain pens. Let me tell you just today. Today I talked to one of you in a video call and um, she was a lovely woman and she had a fountain pen, a Schaefer fountain pen. There's also, of course, Waterman fountain pens and other fountain pens. And it was a beautiful one from 1914. And she said she negotiated. She said, Dr. Laura, you'd be proud of me. I negotiated. I said, good. And she negotiated and she got it for $9. It was a 1914 Schaefer. It was one of the ones that actually men would wear around their neck. So they would wear it like a necklace and then use it. Not women, men. And people say, oh, that's for the dance card. Not for the dance card. It's actually for factories. When you walk through a factory, manufacturer, people in manufacturing used them in the night in 1914 or factory workers. And that particular uh, pen was actually worth $100. So yeah, fountain pens, antique fountain pens are really collectible. Some people like them because they're a small. They're small collectibles. They're not taking up a lot of room. So yeah, they can be valuable too. That particular one was that, and I can evaluate that one and tell you the actual value of that one because I just saw it today, but yours, I would have to see yours. So don't expect they're all worth that. I'd have to see it. So send a picture to drlaurieve.com. Hi, Lynn. My great aunt left me a cordial bottle and six little cups. Uh, they're deep blue with silver floral applique. The cups are tiny, no handles. What did she leave me? Oh, okay. So what she left you, it sounds like she left you a decanter, 
right? So a decanter, a cordial bottle. And then she, the little tiny cups are actually for cordials. Uh, a cordial is uh, a type of liqueur that you would have something like cream de cocoa or cream de mint or something that's sort of, you don't want to drink too much of it and you don't want to drink it in a tumbler like a scotch glass, okay? So um, basically that's what she left you. The silver portion, so if, if it's an insert, right, where it's sort of like a piece of silver here or silver color, maybe silver plate, and then the glass goes in inside, that's pretty typical as well. But you could also have pieces where silver is stenciled on top of, gl of glass, usually on top of glass and not on top of crystal. So that's what she left you. In terms of value, I'd have to see the type. Guy and Jackie, are old tapestries worth much? Okay, old tapestries like large ones, if you turn them over, I want you to look for things like made in Belgium, made in France. It will tell you where it was made and that will help you with the with actual time period. If you see sort of colors that look like a watercolor on the back, that's one of the ways to tell. It kind of looks like the loom has like a watercolor, the textile, then those pieces um, are usually large scale and they're usually late 19th, early 20th century and value can range. So value can range as low as $50, as high as $500. It will depend on what you have. But 99% of them say made in Belgium, made in France, so you know where they're made. Elizabeth, our first edition Harry Potter's worth anything. I love this channel. I watch every day. Thank you for watching every day. I'm glad you love the channel. And yes, first edition Harry Potter books are worth money. And of course, they're worth money. So if they're in good condition, if you have hardbacks and if you have the dust jacket, but I'd have to see, of course, publisher is going to be important as long as they are true first edition. But yes, they are going to be worth money. And what people don't always realize about famous and popular books like, of course, um, I forgot I have my gloves on. <laughs> um, popular books like uh, Harry Potter um, is, in fact, that sometimes subsequent editions can be valuable too. So don't discount it if you don't have the first edition. Subsequent or later editions can have value too. Yep, yep, yep. Send me a picture. I hope you have the dust jacket too. That's the paper jacket on, on the back and I hope it's hardcover. Probably is hardcover of his first edition. Okay, but uh, Kyle, hi Dr. Lori. L-O-R-I, Kyle, L-O-R-I. <laughs> I have a collection of 15 or so antique vintage Colorado cattle brand books. Oh, good. They range from 1906 to 68 and are in excellent condition. Do these have value? Yes, they do have value, Kyle. So those particular cattle brand books are going to be valuable. And a couple of things, know where to sell it. Different parts of the world, they'll sell better. So you want to think about that. I would sell them individually. Yes, I would. People would say, oh, no, I'd sell those as a set. I would not sell those as a set because they're rare and unusual. So when you have so many of them, people are going to want to pay less for them. Thank you for the super chat. I appreciate that, Kyle. I have a collection of Colorado brand books, cattle brands, and they range from this or then are in excellent condition, any value. Okay, they're all in excellent condition. You have 15 of them individually. Certain ones will be a little bit worth a little bit more than others. So you want to be aware of that with respect to the value. Yep, yep, yep. So certain ones a little bit more valuable than others. Catherine. I have a large round wall mirror, beveled edge in a wooden frame with a carved driftwood bird. How can I tell the wood it's made from, please? Do you have any info on this? Yes. One of the things I always tell people is forget the stain, remember the grain. So forget the stain, remember the grain. Because if you look at the grain of a wood, you're going to learn what type of wood it is. Oak has a very, very distinctive grain. But you could stain oak to look like walnut. OK, so look for the grain. So certain grains of wood are going to be very, very small striations of lines. Cherry looks different from oak. Walnut looks different from maple, this kind of thing. So I'd have to see the actual I'd have to see the actual piece to be able to identify the grain for you and then tell you what kind of color stain has been on it. Sometimes it's a maple piece and it's got a maple stain and, and it's correct or it's, you know, pure. But in fact, sometimes they'll use one type of, of wood like pine, and then they'll put a red, a, you know, a red cherry or a red mahogany uh, stain on top of it to, to basically make it look better. So yeah, I'd have to take a look at that. But mirrors in general are very desirable and collectible. Baritone man, your vast knowledge is amazing. Thanks for sharing it with us. You're the best. Thank you very much. And thank you for the super sticker and super chat as well. I appreciate the support of the channel. 
Thank you for your nice words and your compliments. And thank you for that. I'm happy to share it. I'm glad that you're with me. I'm happy that you're here at Ask Dr. Lori Live on Thursday nights, of course. Um, I play Dr. Lori's Treasure Hunt on Saturday nights. I answer questions. I answer questions on Thursday nights too. Sundays are our premiere of our new, of course, video. And the binge link is where you can watch my videos all the time, all the time. Objects that are made by the manufacturers of those particular places. Hi, Bobby. Here's Bobby. I have Royal Dalton China, more teacups, two plates, and courier knives prints. Yes, all valuable. So the Royal Dalton China will be based on which time period? So it's going to have a lion mark. It's going to have the Royal Dalton. It might say it's from Burlesom. It might say it's from Lambeth, right? And that's going to matter for value. And then, of course, the courier knives. There are a lot of courier knives originals and a lot of courier knives reproductions. So you're going to have to have me take a look at the website send the picture, and I'll tell you which, of course, information indicates whether or not you have an original lithograph from Nassau Street in New York by, of course, Courier and Eyes, or if you have one of the reproductions that were given out with calendars and such in the 1950s and 60s by insurance companies that just look like Courier and Eyes. I'll tell you the, the difference. Yeah, nice. Thanks so much for the super, for the super chat, too. Marco, how do you identify a valuable postcard? Hello from I. Okay, well, wherever I is, that's good. I'm going to say it could be the islands, it could be Indy, it could be, I don't know where. But nice to see you, Marco. Marco, the way you tell valuable postcards usually fall into these three categories. Famous people, famous places, famous events. So if you have a, a postcard of President Lincoln, if you have a, po that's valuable. If you have a postcard of, um, let's see, uh, Mount Rushmore, that's going to be valuable. If you have a postcard of a famous event, so that might be the World's Fair right? So those kinds of things. So look for those first, and then you're going to look for sort of the unusual postcards, right? Postcards that might have certain um, elements on them. Postcards that are for birthdays or for Christmas or for Valentine's Day or a holiday are going to be worth a little bit more than the wish you were here kind of postcards. But yeah, if you have a picture postcard from somewhere, they can be valuable. Keep them in an acid-free album or an acid-free um, solander box, which we offer too. Um, thoughts on Paintings on ivory. I have an early American painting of a relative shows birthday of 1770. I was told it has a rose gold case. Is that common? I love the channel. Rose gold is uh, yellow gold with copper. Rose gold is most popular in the early 1900s. You will see um, different types of gold. What you could have is you could have a case that has been replaced. The 1770 era for the, for the actual portrait on ivory is correct. That's called the Rococo period. That period is, of course, late 18th century. Um, in America, you're going to see them. They're more common in Europe, um, but in fact, the uh, the pieces like ivory that's painted is usually more common in Europe, and painted ivory pieces are usually small-scale portraits and can have significant value. Yes, you can send a picture to the website. I'll take a look. Um, what's funny about rose gold, rose gold made this big impact about three or four years ago, and rose gold is still pretty popular now, um, and it looks back to the 100th year revival in the Edwardian period, which was 1915 or so, uh, rose gold was all the rage, and in 2015, rose gold was all the rage, so look for that. Is all mercury glass ornaments vintage, or is it still being made to gay? Okay, mercury, you can't sell antique mercury. So if you have a pendulum, a clock with a pendulum that has mercury in it, you're not supposed to sell it um, because, of course, mercury, mercury or quilt silver, as it was once called, uh, can, of course, be dangerous, toxic. Um, so if you have a mercury or a silvered um, ornament, we usually see most of those from uh, the early years of the 20th century, yes. Um, Hand-blown ornaments from Lausche, Germany, were oftentimes silvered. Uh, you might see them as, as mercury ornaments, um, but in fact, silvered ornaments. Uh, I talk about those in a video that I did about, of course, vintage uh, holiday ornaments. So you can, you can check those out at where? The binge link. You can check that out on the binge link too. So this is Ask Dr. Lori. It's Ask Dr. Lori Live, where I'm answering your questions. Alva, I have a glass vase sign Tosso Murano and dedicated to a couple is that valuable. It's also dated 2001. So yeah. So typically if you're going to see those, Murano uses those stickers and also there's probably some um, ins inscription on it, but people would actually go to Murano. Maybe they're on their honeymoon and they would uh, have an opportunity to have those pieces put together. I'll take a look at it and of course do it. 
Great channel, Fluffy says. Dr. Lori can authenticate a Cecilia Bowl portrait. Of course I can. I'll tell you a very quick story about this. Yes, uh, Fluffy, I certainly can authenticate it. And I'd be happy and proud to. Um, I grew up not in museums. I came to art history after a career in history. I spent a little bit of time going to law school. I didn't really care for it. And uh, worked in museums at the Yale Art Gallery. And I used to go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which was not far from my home. I had to take the train, but I go in and there was a paint, there is a painting there that became a painting that I, I just loved. And I used to go, and when I would go to museums, and I still do this to this day in museums around the world, um, when I go to a particular museum, I'd visit like a friend. So the paintings became the paintings I would always go and see in certain places. So when I'm at the Met, I go and I see, of course, uh, the girl with the nurse, which is a picture of a little girl named Ernesta Drinker. And she's there holding the hand of her nurse. And she's a little tiny girl and she's a brunette and she's quite beautiful. And um, I always loved this painting by Cecilia Bow. Uh, she became the painting that really sparked me on to study art history. I loved American art. I loved American painting. I thought it was beautiful. It was relatively impressionistic. It was all use of whites with a little bit of pink and a little bit of gray. It was just gorgeous. And for a long time, I had a print um, in my bedroom and then later in my office. And in all my offices, I hang that particular print. And that print is of Cecilia Bow. So yeah, I, I know a lot about Cecilia Bow as an American artist, a female artist. Um, didn't have all the opportunities as male artists did at the same time. And I love that painting from the Met. So uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, of course, is in New York. Uh, my dad has a 1907 Hamilton King pastel of a woman. Okay, about 24 inches high. Her face shows pixelated, but the rest of, of the pastel is this normal for his work. Okay, when you say pixelated, we use pixelated like a technology term. That's called pointillist in art history. And it's basically little dabs of, of course, just the brush stroke. And the idea is that, and made famous by an artist named Sir George Surratt, when I taught art history, I used to say, if you want to remember George Surratt, he's the guy who paints with dots. So Surratt the dot. And these are things that my students would be able to hold on to and learn from. These are the things I'm sharing with all of you now, this free education here at this level. You know, not, oh, I'm not sure. And I don't know what this is, but isn't it pretty? That's not the level here at this channel. This channel is I want to teach you how it is. That pixelating that you see or pixelation that you see um, is correctly identified. You're right. That's like pixelation, but basically it's called pointillism. And it's a pointillist thing and it grows out of impressionism. It's that idea of making your optic nerve when you're looking at the painting actually meld or blend all of those little dots together so you can see the eyes of the face, so you can see the structure of the face. It's very, very typical and it really is representative of the artist. So send me a picture, I'll take a look and we can talk about value too. Yeah, nice. I have a cup and saucer with what looks like winged beetles in gold on it. I hope you're enjoying this and I hope you're learning from everybody else's questions. I think it's cool to get everybody else's questions. Uh, pinkish pitchfork mark on the bottom of the cup. I was wondering if the beetle is common in Swansea. Okay, <laughs> so I need to see a picture of the front of the piece, the back of the piece, and a, a clear picture of the mark itself. And I'll take a look at that, and then I'll be able to identify it for you and tell you what is common and what is unusual or rare. Remember about rarity. Rarity is not the only thing people are looking for when it comes to art antiques and collectibles. They're looking for quality materials and they're looking for, of course, good workmanship, good craftsmanship, right? Quality is important. Caden, I have an Imperial 1951 crystal celery vase and was wondering if it's valuable. Okay, so when you say it's a crystal celery vase 1951, upright or is it a celery vase that actually is going to be on it, lay on its side? There are different types. So you have to tell me that information. And with that information, I'll be able to identify it for you. If you're sure it's from the 1950s, um, then that particular piece is going to be um, a little bit, um, a little bit um, easier to identify for that particular, for that particular. But you probably looked it up and you know it's from there. Wanda, a super sticker. Thank you so much, Wanda. Oh, owls. Oh my gosh. Wanda's got an owl there. I like your owl. Um, I have a lot of background, of course, with um, the interest and the symbolism of things like flowers, the symbolism from, of course, the Christianity, the symbolism from different, um, of course, um, other religions, but also animals. Owls, of course, relate to wisdom and knowledge. And my dad collected owls. And when my father passed away, I really found myself seeing all these owls. And I thought, okay, this is kind of odd, 
But in fact, when I see an owl, I kind of have a little thought of, oh, wow, maybe, you know, that has something to do with my dad collecting owls. But owls, um, just like certain other animals, have different rel uh, relative elements. Um, as a little kid, I was always a chubby little kid, and I was teased a lot, like a lot of chubby little kids. And um, they, in fact, would say elephants. And uh, that was when I started learning about the symbolism of different of different animals. Elephants actually have a whole lot of loyalty associated with him. So with them. So sometimes when someone would say something derogatory, like a, a, a slight, like, oh, an elephant slight, I would say, well, you know, they're loyal at least. So, but owls relate to, of course, knowledge, wisdom, and um, oftentimes I'll, I'll, they relate to, again, the, ex the exchange of wisdom or information. What about the ashtray in front of you? The ashtray in front of me is not an ashtray. In fact, the ashtray in front of me is actually a um, jewel. It's a jewelry or trinket. So you put your earrings or you would put your, your necklaces in it. It does look like an ashtray. And I will tell you, I had an aunt who would have used something like that as an ashtray. She used to smoke, you know, two packs of camels a day. <laughs> And uh, she used to tell the doctors when they said, you better stop smoking. She'd say, hey, buddy, I won this game. I'm 98 and I won. <laughs> so she'd keep smoking. <laughs> it was funny. But anyway, um, but that's a trinket or a jewelry trinket. You could use it as an ashtray as, as well. And of course, it dates to the 1950s, 1960s. Yeah, thanks for asking. Wanda, super sticker from the owl. Thank you very much, Wanda. You're sweet. Thank you so much. So we're imparting wisdom back and forth with Wanda and all the rest of you. Remember when you do a super sticker or when you do a super chat, you're supporting the channel. You're helping us to, of course, make more videos. And for those of you who are saying things like, oh, I can't see something. Oh, will you do this? You should really do this. And you should use that camera and you should do. We are doing our best on, of course, this particular budget. I want you to make sure that you realize that we are doing our best to show you everything. And we are, of course, in just our editing and with all of our videos, I can I see what others are doing and I know what we are doing is high, a high standard with respect to the visual so you can see everything. We're making sure of that. I'm not just looking into you know some little thing and not having it edited and not doing it. We're doing it at a very, very high level comparatively. So yes, I'll do my best to make sure you can see everything um, but we're doing a lot in editing, and that, of course, takes staff time, which, of course, has budgets associated with it. So thank you for your um, understanding that we are doing our best to make sure that you get a great video experience here, not only great and, and a good quality source of information, but also a good video experience. My dad would have used the wooden shoes as ashtrays. <laughs> okay, Harry, your dad can do whatever he wants, just like you, Harry. I hope you're doing well tonight. Happy Saturday night, Harry. Yeah. So they would have used it as that. Miss Heather, thank you for the super chat. Dr. Laura, you're a hero to me. Oh, you're so nice. I watch you every single day. Thank you. Thank you for watching every single day. My adult son says, Ma, you need to ask, seek a Dr. Lori addiction group. Well, there's a lot of those, let me tell you. For Mother's Day, you better get me that Dr. Lori. Yes, well, you know what? You deserve it for your birthday and any Dr. Lori merchandise. And I'm going to give you a little gift right now. Go to the YouTube community tab. Make sure you're a subscriber so you can go to the YouTube secure community tab and you can get some of our specials. The extras are on the community tab. So that's wonderful. Go there and utilize it. I'm offering some specials on the community tab for the t-shirts. The Dr. Lori says t-shirt, pink and blue. I like the blue too. I think the blue is pretty. And then of course, uh, the mug, which is great. Hi, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Where do we send pictures for items? Is there a cost? You can send photos to drlaurieV.com and it'll say find values and then you hit send a photo and you send me a photo of your object. Do not send objects. Do not send objects. Um, don't send objects to anybody to get them reviewed, to get them conserved, to get them checked. Don't do that because you probably not, won't see your object. We would not accept it. I wouldn't accept an object. But photos, go to my website. If you want a written appraisal, there is a cost. There is no cost for me to look at it. So I will review it. Yep. You can do it right there on my website. I'm happy to do that. And thank you for supporting the channel. I appreciate that very much. You're supporting it by watching. You're supporting it, um, of course, by also sharing and by subscribing. I have the pink and the blue and you love them. And the mug rocks it like Dr. Lori. Thank you, Lori Disney. I'm so glad you have it. Did you, you still have the candy canes in yours? She said she had the candy canes in hers as a decoration um, in her home. And the t-shirts are a lot of fun too. I have saucers that are in the pastel color made in Bavaria, and I'm looking for the cups to match. Any ideas where I can get them? Yeah, lots of ideas. 
I want you to search for not only the maker, but I want you to search for the color. I want you to, and these are some of the tips for when you're trying to find something, right? You're trying to find a comparison. You're trying to find an object you want to buy or you want to sell. I want you to look for um, any attributes of those particular cups that are unusual. Is it a scrolled handle? Does it have gilt around the banding or around the rim? Um, is it a, a coffee cup, right? A coffee cup, which is larger, right? Or a tea cup? Is it a bouillon cup with two handles? So try to describe it as you try to search for it. You might have better luck. And don't forget about the color. A lot of people will do that too. You had to eat the, the <laughs> you had to eat the, uh, the peppermint, the, uh, the peppermint sticks. That's funny. <laughs> the candy canes. That's funny. I'm so glad. Karen, can't wait for some Dr. Lori high quality figurines to start being sold so we can collect them. Well, you know, you saw the buyer's choice figurine of me that they made. It was me at my antiques appraisal table. We had it on, it's on one of the videos. It's probably on a couple of the videos. The folks at Buyer's Choice, the, the great caroler, of course, figurines made it in. It's me in my black skirt, my red sweater, and my pin, kind of like how I look tonight. You know, and I'm singing. You know, they have their, 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 eyes, their mouths open. They're pretty characteristic. And they're wonderful people at Buyer's Choice Limited. And uh, I like those collectibles a lot. Just put flowers on it. That's right. Uh, so thank you very much for your generous super chat. I love mantle lusters. Wow. Okay. Your mantle lusters are probably beautiful. They're a nice collectible. A lot of people don't realize what they are, that they actually are for the candles to go in. And then you can, of course, watch all of the reflective elements. Uh, you watch the glass, the, the, the lit, the lit candles actually reflect all over. So, um, it's good if you, of course, collect them, make sure that you, um, Make sure that you are careful with, of course, the candles and make sure that you alternate. If you have more than one, don't use the same ones all the time. So nice, nice, nice. I never leave home without Dr. Lori's loop. I know, Donald. I know. Isn't the loop great? Don't leave home without the loop. I always say have a couple loops, maybe one or two, you know, one in your pocket, one in the car. The loop is going to help. And I don't care if you have 20-20 vision. The loop is really going to help. This one, of course, has the light. And the light is really terrific. I won't blind you. But um, this particular loop is the one that I recommend that I really like. I usually wear it on a lanyard. You know, I usually wear it around my neck. You know, it's a nice, good jeweler's loop. And it's got two. It's at, of course, Dr. Lori's specials. The specials page is right on our website at the top of the page. It says save now right there. You can't miss it at the top in red. Um, so look for that. Of course, look for the loop. Love the channel. You learn so much. Fifth Avenue Vintage, thank you so much. Thank you for watching the channel, sharing the channel, and subscribing. I appreciate that too. So I'm glad you love the channel. Guy and Jackie, they're back. Dr. Laura, you're priceless. Thanks for sharing your knowledge. Oh, you guys are wonderful. You're wonderful. I appreciate it. I appreciate so much that you're being with me, and I appreciate your super chats too. Um, it really means a lot to me, and it helps everybody. So you're helping your fellow subscribers, but you're also helping the channel to grow. And as the channel grows, of course, we can offer more. Right now on the community tab, go there and you can get what is the special for tonight for being with me and Ask Dr. Lori live. So really a lot of fun tonight. It was fun to talk a little bit about Venice, of course, beautiful Venice and the great Murano, the Murano uh, glass factory, uh, the, the glass factory that started in the 1200s AD and has been continuing. Those furnaces have been making beautiful glass for centuries and centuries. Of course, uh, talking a little bit about travel and about thrifting and how to sell smart and what to look for and how to learn more about what you've got, what it's really worth. Of course, I'm Dr. Lori. Don't forget to check out our binge link. Thanks for being with me. I'll see you next time.